from the City Council meeting on the 12th of June, 2017. Uh, let us all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a period of silent meditation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In accordance with LB 898, a copy of the Open Meetings Act is posted at the back of the chamber for your reading pleasure. Uh, we will now have the Mayor's Award of Excellence. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, how are you today? Wonderful. Members of the Council, thank you again for uh, giving us a little time to present the Mayor's Award of Excellence this time. Uh, for the month of April, uh, to a team of police officers known as the Gang Unit. Uh, not because they're a gang, but <laughs> because they go after gangs. <laughs> and the team includes four investigators, Stephen Barry and, uh, why don't you raise your hand when I call your name, Stephen Barry and Max Hubka and Cole Jennings and Dustin Lynn. And they were nominated in the category of productivity by Sergeant Jeff Sorensen for their work on three different cases involving gang activity. Sergeant Sorensen said these cases illustrate the dedication these officers have to creating a safer community for us all. Uh, between uh, February and March, the team coordinated a follow-up investigation into a series of shootings and assaults occurring between two rival gangs. The rivalry resulted in four incidents, a shooting in the area of 19th and A, an assault at 33rd and Holdridge, a traffic accident at 15th and A, and a shooting at a Super, Super C convenience store. And during the course of this investigation, the unit was instrumental in seizing two firearms, marijuana, a scale, packaging material. Team members also served two residential and four vehicle search warrants. They arrested four individuals for a variety of felony charges related to the shooting, uh, to shooting into an occupied vehicle use of a weapon to commit a felony terroristic threats and position of possession of marijuana with intent to deliver and a concealed weapon. During an unrelated investigation in March, Lynn, Hubka, and Barry assisted uniformed officers with an incident in which several known gang members chased a victim in a car and purposely ran the vehicle they were in uh, into the victim's vehicle. Uh, because of their assistance with this investigation, two more violent gang members were arrested on several felony charges. During a third investigation in March, the team began surveillance of another known gang member with a violent past while, searching, while serving a search warrant at his residence. They located a couple of pounds of marijuana, a scale, and packaging material. The gang member and one of his associates were later arrested for possession of marijuana with intent to deliver. Sorensen says the unit is also responsible for investigating uh, gang-related incidents on a daily basis, uh, always gathering intelligence, uh, conducting presentations, and meeting with the community to build a positive relationship uh, for LPD. Uh, with uh, Lincoln residents. An example of this community outreach was a late March meeting with Leffler Middle School students in the Community Learning Center program. During this time, they played three-on-three -three basketball with the students, shared pizza, and answered student questions about law enforcement. So it's my pleasure today to present uh, Stephen and Max and Cole and Dustin with the Mayor's Award of Excellence for March. Please joining me, join me in congratulating them on their hard work. And 
Stephen. And Matt. Yes, sir. Thank you. And I think your boss wants to say a few words. Just a couple. There he is. Uh, Thanks, Mayor. Mayor, thank you, and Council, thanks. This group, it epitomizes the balance between suppression and enforcement, and that's much of what the mayor relayed to you today. But it's also about the educational component and getting involved and immersing themselves in these communities, building relationships. That's been one of the most impressive things about this squad, is that they can balance that. They can build a relationship with the relatives, the individuals themselves that are culpable for some of the most violent acts that are occurring here in Lincoln. And for that, they should really be applauded. Um, it it uh, exemplifies a squad mentality. Jeff Sorensen, who's sit, sitting right there behind them, and Sergeant Marty Sor or Captain Marty Ferringer, who's sitting back here, allows and fosters an environment where all four of these individuals can flourish and in the recent months too, then they take an opportunity to mentor and develop other employees within the Lincoln Police Department to show them all the great things that they're doing. This balance, enforcement, suppression, and immersing themselves in the community. And uh, I couldn't be more proud of all of their activities. They do an outstanding job, and hopefully they'll come up here and introduce you to their families. So, thank you. Yeah. You guys want to say anything great if you just want to introduce your families you can do that too max go ahead and go first all right um my name is max hupka i'm very pleased to be receiving this um mr mayor thank you and uh please for the time in front of the council uh, my family is in the back corner i have my wife annie and my young daughter molly um i uh the investigations that were mentioned um in the the reading by the mayor resulted in a lot of uh, over time, a lot of late nights and early mornings, and it put a little bit of a, a strain on, on my wife having to take care of, of Molly and get to work. So um, this award is, is on her behalf as well because she definitely put in work to help uh, achieve the uh, outcome that we did. Yeah, Again, my name is Dustin Lind. I'm here with my wife, Trish, and daughter, Brindley. Uh, like Max said, uh, we wouldn't be here without the support of the family. Um, thanks to our boss, Jeff, for nominating us, and uh, Captain Ferringer and both Chief Blightmaster and Jackson for uh, supporting us, allowing us to do what we want to do. Hello, I'm Cole Jennings. Um, I want to thank the council and the mayor for awarding us this award today, and of course, Chief for speaking, Sergeant Jeff for everything he does and support. Um, I'm here with, I think, my wife. <laughs> my wife and, and my, my son Sawyer, he's our first child, and we had him right in the midst of a lot of this, so without her support, I wouldn't be able to do the work that uh, got done on these cases, so I want to thank her a lot. I'm Steve Berry. Um, the benefit of going last is that everything that needed to be said got said, so um, I'm also here with my family. Uh, my wife and my three boys uh, <laughs> right over there. Um, <laughs> uh, this is the quietest they've been in the long time. <laughs> I'll thank you for that, too. But thanks, Chief. Thanks, Council. Thanks, Mayor. And thanks, Sergeant Swanson. Thank you. One, one thing that I forgot to point out too is that for Max and Cole, they're two years into their stint and their positions have been afforded by our partnership with the COPS grant. And so their, their salaries are subsidized through the federal government um, for three years. And without that assistance, you know, I'm not certain that we could have allowed to, to build the, the squad like they have. And undoubtedly, they're making a positive impact on our community. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll give all of you who would like to leave a chance to leave the chamber while I read the next important announcement. The order of business of the City Council is as follows. The clerk will call the items listed on the agenda under public hearing. 
Anyone wishing to speak on an item should come forward after the clerk reads that item. The applicant and those in favor should speak first, then those opposed. The applicant may then make one short rebuttal. Each speaker should begin by stating name, address, and whether you are speaking in favor or in opposition to the item. Testimony is limited to five minutes per speaker. After all public hearings, the council will vote on resolutions and items listed under third reading. On the second and last meetings of the month, immediately prior to adjournment, anyone may speak on any issue not on the agenda for that date, nor planned for a future agenda. Today is one of those days. Will the clerk please call the first item of business? Yes, our first item is our public hearing consent agenda. They are items one through 26. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Pat Leach, the director of Lincoln City Libraries, and I want to introduce Lisa Hale, who is our uh, recommended person for a role on the Lincoln City Library Board for a term that would be expiring in August on August 31st of 2021 to fill uh, a vacant seat on the library board. Lisa is with the Lincoln Electric System as vice president of customer service. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us about yourself and what brings you to this point in life. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long story. Um, so I've been working for Lincoln Electric for five years. Um, my husband and I just recently were able to relocate to Lincoln. Um, public libraries have played a very important role in my life. As, as a child, I can remember going when I was two and three with my grandmother to, um, I grew up in a small town, to our public library and did the same with my children. And so I just feel very strongly about public libraries and it was a way that I really wanted to get involved in the community. Okay. Are there any questions for Ms. Hale? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to testify on this or any of the items on the consent agenda? Seeing none. All right. If not, we can vote on these items. Items 1 through 14 were introduced by Gaylor Baird. So moved. Second. Moved by Larry and seconded by Carl. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Kaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Items 6 and 18 through 24 were introduced by Raybold. So moved. Second. Moved by Jane, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Next in are our public hearing liquor resolutions. Those giving testimony are asked to come forward, raise their right hand for the clerk to administer the oath. After the oath, witnesses shall state their names and addresses. I'll call items 27 and 28 together. They are the application of Fairway Meat Market number 175 for a Class C liquor license at 3033 South 84th Street and the related manager application of Joel Wymore. Just raise your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you verily believe it to be. I do. Thank you. Thank you, members of the council. I'm uh, Kobe Pritchard. I'm with Fairway Stores. Uh, Joel is not here today. I'm on his behalf as well. Um, I'm here to discuss the application for our Class C liquor license. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with Fairway, but a little bit of background. Um, we've been in business for 80 years now. Um, we're here to discuss the new Lincoln meat market that's going to open up in November of 2017, so coming up. Um, we currently have 117 locations with uh, our first meat market in Omaha. Um, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to take care of them. Okay, any questions for Mr. Pritchard? Thank you, sir. Oh, let me, oh let me, Carl. That's what it is. Yeah. So you, in, you indicate it's a meat market. It's a meat market, yep. It's, uh, <laughs> it's what Fairway uh, prides themselves on is their, their, their meat selection. Okay. And obviously we sell groceries, but the backbone of our business is the meat. So we're kind of uh, exploiting that and going with our new meat market uh, agenda. So tell us about the alcohol side of your meat market. Uh, the alcohol <laughs> side, it's uh, kind of an ancillary position. Um, this facility will be about 6,500 square feet, and only about 1,000 of that will be for the sale of beer, wine, liquor. 
Um, so it's a very small part, but it's kind of just a way to get the high class meats as well as, you know, get drinks if, if you want them. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right, next are items 29 and 30, application of Paisanos for a class I liquor license at 2740 South Street, as well as the related manager application of Matthew Quintero. Just raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth as you verily believe it to be? I do. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Quintero, and I live at 1000 Sycamore Drive. And myself and two business partners just took over ownership of Paisanos at 27th and South Street. So I'm here to make sure that the liquor license that they already have gets continued under our uh, under the new ownership. Uh, right now, we just serve three tap beers and five different kinds of wine. I might expand a little bit in the future, but uh, uh, just to like bottled beer or anything, we're not going to install a bar or anything. Any questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you going to maintain the same high quality pizza that you have been serving all these years? <laughs> That's the question. That's really the question. Of course. Um, okay. Very uh, kindly, the old owner, uh, Greg Friesen, has agreed to stay on for three months to train me. And I, I will also be the new general manager. Uh, how, to, how to make everything the same. Um, we uh, have the recipes that the original owner, the Burner family, uh, had written, laminated <laughs> in a specific uh, place. So the everything will stay exactly the same uh, food quality wise. That's great to hear. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, Carl. well on the same, in the same vein. <laughs> the, the Sunday night uh, tradition of Paisano's was uh, all you can eat spaghetti. Mm -hmm. Is that continuing? Oh yes, okay. uh, we were uh, on a wait for, uh, okay. we had about a half hour wait for over an hour yesterday because right. you know limited seating and everything but it's uh, still quite popular. Right. Cindy. Um, so Thanks for being here today. Mm -hmm. I saw on the application that you were supposed to attend a class last week. Did you, in fact, make that class? Yeah. No, I made it. Oh, good. That's what I wondered. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. sorry. I thought, I thought you said, did you not make that class? I'm like, oh, no, I did. No, I said, did you, in fact? I'm sorry. Oh, yes, I did. Yeah, so. okay. It's Thank lawyer you, speak. Man. That's all. It's lawyer speak. <laughs> okay. It is not lawyer speak. <laughs> Just give me a hard time. Wait. That's okay. Added. Sorry. Thank you very much. Word. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to speak on this item? Next item, please. All right, next is item 31, application of Zoo Bar for an SDL to cover an outdoor area measuring approximately 438 feet by 267 feet at 14th Street between O and P Streets on July 7th between 4 p.m. and 1 a.m. and July 8th between noon and 1 a.m. Hi. Hi, Pete. Hi, I'm uh, Pete Waters from the Zoo Bar. Tell us about your application. Um, we were going to uh, continue to do the Zoo Fest that's uh, commemorating the, uh, uh, the 44th anniversary of the Zoo Bar uh, outdoors for two days. Um, pretty similar as the way, that, the way it's been in the past. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Waters? Thank you, sir. Thank Thanks. you very much. Anyone like to testify on this item? Mr. Chair, I'd move approval of items 27 through 31. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Larian. Discussion? Please call the roll. Rabel? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Next, then, is our public hearing resolutions, item 32, accepting the report of new and pending claims against the city and approving disposition <laughs> of claims set forth for the period of May 16th through the 31st, 2017. I will read into the record. We did receive an email from Kevin Keith at 2828 North 23rd Street stating that um, he thought his denial should be overturned and he should be granted his claim. Okay. Would anyone like to testify on this item? Okay. Next item, please. All right. I'll we, call. I'm sorry. Oops, yeah, sorry. we maybe want to bring up Jeff to talk about that email and whether or not there's any okay. response from the law department. Jeff Kirkpatrick, city attorney. 
the uh, claim by Mr. Keith was in regard to a cell phone. He was uh, arrested for, ironically enough, stealing cell phones out of cars. And uh, the three phones that were in his possession were taken to the police property. One of them, turns out he owned, that was released to police, the police property unit who sent him a letter at his last known address. The letter came back, uh, receiver unknown, and uh, about a month after that, the phone was destroyed because we had no address for him. Thank you. Thank you. So tell me the process start. I'm like more interested in the timeline. How long is it between the time that the police took this into custody and the time they notified him and the time it was destroyed? Because as I recall, these things take a long time. Well, it depends upon how the case develops. Um, let's see if I can. Citation was issued uh, December of 2015. Um, actually, I think it was fairly quickly mm -hmm. determined that it was his phone. The letter was sent out in December of 15 returned January 11th of 2016, and then the phone was actually destroyed in February of 16. So was the case over by then? Uh, well, it wasn't necessary for the case because it wasn't evidence of a crime, it was his phone. It okay. just happened to be in his possession at the time he was arrested. Okay, and do you know with the rest of the case, was he appointed counsel? Uh, I think that the case that he was arrested on was dismissed, and he was in fact uh, sentenced uh, on another case, another theft case, and he had spent, um, was sentenced to 36 to 48 months in the Thank pen. Thank you. Other questions? Jane. Did Mr. Keith ever make inquiries through his attorney, or did he ever contact the police department inquiring about his cell phone and the whereabouts and when he may collect it? Uh, he did eventually submit a claim. But that was uh, a claim or, or just a phone call and request? No. He could have had somebody stop by and pick it up. But of course, he didn't have, uh, his mail wasn't being forwarded to him. So. But, but still, he knew that one of the phones was his. Yes. So he didn't well, stop by and I say, hey. I think he was hey. in the pen. He had other things going on. Okay. Just to, is that? timeline that you outlined for the destruction of that property consistent with timelines for the destruction of property claimed by, or taken in by the police in other cases? Or is there anything exceptional about this situation? Well, I think the exception here is it, it was fairly quick because it was not evidence of a crime. And so if you have property that's taken that's evidence of the crime, we, we have to hold on to it until the trial mm -hmm. and the appeal time is run. And so sometimes that goes for years and years, which is part of the reason why we destroy property because we can't hold on to everything forever. Gee. But if you have established that it is his personal property and then when he, uh, I guess, uh, was taken into custody and into the penitentiary, wouldn't his personal possessions transfer from the city or the county to the state where he was serving his time? I, I don't think you're allowed to have a cell phone in prison. But I mean, but his it personal be a, property that was on him would be tagged and recorded and held for him while he was doing his time. And yes. And yeah, did, I think is that customary? That would be customary. The distinction here was when the phones, there were three phones in his custody, were placed in a property. It was not clear to the police at that time what was stolen and what perhaps was not stolen. So it was all placed together. Then it was investigated and was ascertained what was stolen and what was not. And at that time, they would have, had he been reachable, they would have notified him, we have your property, please come and get it. That's what they attempted to do. But were they not aware that he was in the penitentiary at that time? And why wouldn't his personal property have been transferred along with him? Because you notified him by a letter that this was your personal property, but were, at that point in time, was not your department or aware that he had been incarcerated? Not that particular department. They had an address for him. They sent a letter out. The letter came back with no further address. And at that point, they proceeded to destroy the property. They didn't 
spent a lot of time searching for him, which perhaps they would have done in the best of all possible worlds. But in this case, I think they followed the protocol of we've got an address, the address is no longer good, we're not going to search all over the world trying to find him for a $200 phone. Okay, so I get, I'll ask the last question. If it is last question, I don't know. Um, so the rationale for denying this claim is? Well, the rationale, the legal rationale is that the statute of limitations has run. And if you deny this claim, he has no recourse in the law because it's been over a year since the phone was actually destroyed. Okay. That's the legal rationale. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, and, and as to the amendment, just wanted to bring to your attention, you have an amendment. There's another denied claim. We received contact from the woman whose claim is being denied, saying she was unavailable to be here today, as is our usual practice. We're asking you to take her denied claim off of the resolution, and then we'll put it back on at some time in the future where hopefully she'll have an opportunity to come and speak to you. Okay, we'll take care of that during the voting session then. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right, next. next is item 33, approving an interlocal agreement between the city, Lancaster County, and Saunders County for the development of a local workforce investment system. Thank you. I'm Jan Norlander Jensen, workforce administrator for the city. Before you today is a continuation of an interlocal agreement for the city, Lancaster, and Saunders counties in their designation as the Greater Lincoln Local Area under current federal legislation, which is now the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA. Um, WIOA replaced the former legislation, the Workforce Investment Act of WIA. So I have to be very careful when I'm pronouncing these vowels, which um, law that I'm referring to. This agreement does continue the designation of the mayor of Lincoln as the chief elected official for the greater Lincoln local area. Previous law, WIA, interlocal agreement, dates back to 1999, and I believe the local area designation of Greater Lincoln as Lancaster and Saunders actually predates that. This interlocal agreement is on Saunders County agenda tomorrow and will go before the Lancaster County Board next week. Just as background, there are two other local areas in the state. Greater Omaha is Douglas, Sarpy, and Washington with the mayor of Omaha designated as their chief elected official. And then Greater Nebraska is the remaining 88 counties. And they actually have a chief elected officials board with representatives from each of their five regions, being the Panhandle, Mid Plains, Central, Southeast, and Northeast. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Cindy. Thank you, Ms. Norlander. Thanks for being here today. Absolutely. Um, I just had a quick question because on the fact sheet that you prepared, it showed the city's sh uh, share of this uh, at um, 90, let me have it, $94,046. And I saw in our, uh, in the budget that it was for 82705 Do you know what that difference is attributable to? I don't. I don't have those figures with me. I don't know if that would be perhaps a column of whether it was proposed or actual. And there's also general fund allocation given to both the board side of the, this equation as well as some of the operations. So I can certainly research that and get back to you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Would you please give me that figure again so I can be sure that I'm Sure. Uh, in the budget, I saw 82705 and on your sheet, you have $94,046. I will, I will definitely research that and respond. Thank you. You bet. Larry. Hello. Hi. I was hoping you could just tell us a little bit about what this program seeks to accomplish, what that $94,000 pays for, and, and maybe some results you've, you've been able to achieve through this program since it is a continuation. I'd just like to get a little more information. It is a continuation. Um, actually, it's federal money. It comes to the state of Nebraska through Nebraska Department of Labor, and then it is allocated to the three local areas that I just mentioned. In Greater Lincoln, we receive actually three separate grants. We receive youth, dislocated worker, and adult. And youth is sort of my passion, so I'll talk about that first. Um, that money is for developing a work ethic, obtaining an educational credential, and helping youth choose a career pathway. And 
it's it's just very interesting. Um, there's also paid work experience. There can be apprenticeships. There can be work-based training. Lots to do in the youth area. Dislocated worker, that grant is primarily to shorten the time between worker dislocation and reemployment. Um, we have actually um, a state-recognized program called a reemployment services program that is nationally recognized. And that partnership is over at the American Job Center and is a, I believe it's a program actually out of Nebraska Department of Labor Employment Services. Adult services, job search assistance, work-based training again, as I mentioned, classroom training, and that's primarily done through Southeast Community College. The money also goes to support an American Job Center that is located at Southeast Community College downtown campus, second floor. We have on-site partners of Nebraska Department of Labor, Voc Rehab, we have um, Veterans Services, obviously Southeast Community College Adult Ed, and then we also have partners that provide direct linkage for their services, such as Health and Human Services, um, Community Action, Unemployment Insurance, Indian Center, et cetera. For that um, American Job Center, we have a resource room. They average visits of over 1,000 customers, excuse me, 1,000 customer visits a month, which equate to a little over 600 individuals using that American Job Center. Okay, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right, next is item 34, authorizing a transfer of appropriations in the amount of $25,000 from miscellaneous budget contingency to general expense to sponsor the Nebraska 150th celebration. Good afternoon, I'm Rick Hoppe from the Mayor's Office and want to chat with you a little bit about the events uh, surrounding Nebraska's statehood celebration and how the city of Lincoln can help celebrate our state's history and culture. I'm gonna put something up on the screen here, and I wanna ask, how many of you remember the old television program, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Remember that, okay. Because we're gonna play Are You Smarter Than a Nebraska Fourth Grader very briefly here. Recall <laughs> that fourth grade bad, is the traditional year that you study Nebraska history. So the first question for the council, and we'll see how sharp you are here, is the first person to make a claim under the Homestead Act in 1863, that lovely national monument just outside of Beatrice, does the council know, is it James Dawes, John Sheeve, Daniel Freeman, or our own John Camp? <laughs> yes, you're that old, Mr. Camp. Daniel Freeman beat me to it. Daniel Freeman beat Mr. Camp to it. Is that what the council's going with? Yes. The council is absolutely correct. That's a great start here. Okay. I'm good for John Nebraska go became the blank state on March 1st, 1867. We're the 31st state, the 34th state, the 37th state, or the 49th state. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> See. <laughs> See, well, okay, at least two of you are demonstrating that you're smarter than the fourth grader. And the last question for our game, who was Nebraska's first governor? Was it Jay Sterling Morton, David Butler, Silas Garber, or Pete Ricketts? B. Garber, I think. B, David Butler. C. Any other guesses? C. I think it's B. It is David Butler, he, oh. who in fact Thank ended up being <laughs> impeached from his office. Okay, well, toward that note, just as we're sharing our knowledge of Nebraska history and culture, uh, a number of groups are working hard to share that same thing with the citizens of our state through a series of events in Lincoln later here in the fall. Uh, the Friends of 150 Foundation have been raising money in order to put these events on the city. We think they have a lot of potential to drive tourism in our community and more importantly to celebrate the great uh, state of Nebraska as it should be celebrated. So they'd asked us to put in some money in the city of Lincoln and I talked to the mayor and staff the budget office and we talked about taking $50,000 to support the event out of the contingency fund for the 2016 to 18 budget year. Uh, I did have a conversation subsequently with Mr. Camp, and he had suggested that we talk to the Visitors Promotion Committee to see if we could set up um, some sort of matching fund where they could contribute to this. And lo and behold, uh, the Visitors and Convention Bureau thought it was a great idea. Jeff Mall uh, put $25,000 into his budget to do a lot of the promotion associated with the events and to match whatever we did as a city. So kudos to you, Mr. Camp. Great idea. Turned out pretty well. 
And so today what we're asking is for the city to come through with an additional 25000 on top of what the CVB has put forward so that we can go ahead and have a first-rate celebration in the fall uh, regarding our Statehood Day. I should point out to you that we are doing pretty well in the contingency fund. You recall that we budgeted six hundred, excuse me, seven hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars a year for two years in that fund, and we carried over from the previous year about eight hundred thousand uh, dollars. That was parking funds and kind of a, a if everything else goes goes south, that we'd go into that funding. But the the first two amounts would be spent first. Well, since that time, all we've spent out of it has been that thirty-five thousand dollars that the council committed to the Willard Community Center for the expansion they were doing, and about $30,000 in some legal fees that needed to be paid. So of the $765,000 that we budgeted for the current year, we've spent about $65,000. We've got that remaining $700,000. We've got the backup, and I emphasize backup of the parking funds of that $800,000, and then a new appropriation in the upcoming budget year of that $765,000. Uh, Mr. Jeff Searcy of the Nebraska 150 Foundation is here to talk in a couple minutes about what those events will be. I wanted to come up here and just take a few minutes of your time and let you know what we were thinking behind this and some of the background. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good presentation. Would anyone else like to testify, like Mr. Searcy? Yeah. I'm thinking about challenging Mr. Hoppy to say the name of the celebration. Right yet? I, I've heard you say sesquicentennial. <laughs> no, I can't, I can't <laughs> Good afternoon, Council. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Jeff Searcy. I have the honor of serving as chair of the Nebraska 150 Foundation, and we're very excited, but I have to... Uh, Rick, you know, you, you're fourth grade. Are you smarter than a Nebraska fourth grader? Okay, so one more for you, right? Oh. Okay, here we go. Who knows what building this would be. I'm on there. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> here we go. There you go. Okay, and that's what we're here to talk about is the Nebraska 150 celebration that's been geared up. We've been working on it for literally years, and and I know most of you know that, but it's such an honor to just be before you today, and I thank you for that that chance to uh, kind of express our enthusiasm about Nebraska's 150th celebration of statehood. And here is what had happened when we began to look into what uh, is the, the most maybe fitting tribute for the capital city. What is uh, the kind of tribute that would make the most sense? I looked and did research into the centennial from 1967, read the final report of the centennial, and it was very interesting because the news uh, reports and the, those that were very highly involved, they were, they were super excited and thrilled really with the grassroots approach of the centennial, the local communities, the parades, the events, the projects, all of that was fantastic and it got great notoriety. But the one thing that the news accounts kind of questioned or wondered about at the end of the day, at the end of 1967, was that there was no kind of culminating event, no grand finale, no kind of exclamation point on the centennial of Nebraska. And so as a group, the Nebraska 150 Foundation wanted to uh, try to make sure that didn't happen again. And so we looked at what could be the right type of event, what could be the right uh, celebration, what could be maybe even the right venue for that culminating event. And we looked at uh, and feel like it's a very fitting tribute for the capital city to highlight our newly re renovated, revitalized Centennial Mall as that great opportunity for uh, this, this culminating event. And so we're looking at September 22nd and 23rd. It is the homecoming weekend uh, that, that weekend, and also we're working in coordination with the university who's going to theme that, uh, that weekend and game with the 150th. And so together on Centennial Mall, our hopes are on Friday after a, a large event at the Capitol that's going to dedicate the, uh, the garden sculptures of the, the uh, fountains there in the Capitol in the four courtyards, then on to Centennial Mall where there'll be 
fun, festive family events through the evening and then culminating, we hope, subject to, to funding with that grand fireworks display and uh, just a great opportunity to, to bring Nebraskans together from all over. In fact, I was at the Capitol earlier today. There was a press conference speaking of fourth graders, Rick, on that, looking at what's called the Nebraska Experience. And the Nebraska Experience is a program that was unveiled today uh, that would allow and encourage fourth graders from all over the state to be able to make that kind of that historic trip to the Capitol. And what we found is that, you know, we live here in Lincoln, we're very blessed. We can take our kids or grandkids and, and go to the Capitol anytime. But there are a lot, of, a lot of folks in Nebraska that don't have that opportunity to just, you know, head to the Capitol and say hello. Well, this program's gonna do that, but I feel that the sesquicentennial opportunity before us with the the, the spectacular, the salute to the good life is what we're calling it on September 22nd on Centennial Mall will be that opportunity to bring people in from all across the state that maybe have said, you know, the 150th, that's a great opportunity. Let's go to Lincoln. Let's, let's be a part of that. Let's, let's take a look at everything that's been going on through this exciting year. And let's also be able to showcase as a community uh, our statewide effort that we put into and you've assisted with through the years the revitalization of Centennial Mall. So all together I really feel it's a grand opportunity for for all of us to uh, to showcase Nebraska and to also be a fantastic uh, feather in the cap for the capital city. Questions for Mr. Searcy? John. Yeah. Well, you know, I miss Daniel Freeman, but here's a photo of my high school graduating class in 1967 in front of Lincoln High. We had a donkey, a burrow, and we had people in clothing. I'm sorry I didn't get it to, channel, to our Channel 5 people. So we're watching it, and we're having our 50th reunion here July or June 30th and July 1st. Very and we're exciting. We're going to re-celebrate it. Very exciting. Thank you. All right. Carl. Look yes, thanks. Appreciate your work on this, Jeff, and, and it's, it's really you, important to do to, to celebrate the state. And when, when this was all starting, I, I was thinking, you know, how about the city? And have talked to uh, Ed Zimmer, to, you know, is there a, what, what's the city's 150th? And, and he said, well, there's not really a great date. Um, we became a county in 1859, I believe, um, we became the capital in August of uh, 1867, um, but we weren't an incorporated city we until 1869. We were in 1857 because Lincoln celebrated its centennial in 1957 with George Goble going down M Street. <laughs> Well, we weren't a city. That might have been the first time there was a white settler here or something, but we weren't incorporated until 1869. So it, it, we were a capital before we were incorporated. So, um, yeah, it's uh, so I, th I think the, the conclusion is uh, there's not a great date for the city. And the, our best date for the city is, is, is when, you know, Nebraska became a state and we became the capital. It just so having that joint celebration is, is good enough for me. I think that's a great plan. So thank you. Sounds good. Thank you for your support in Nebraska's sesquicentennial year of 2017. All right. Thank any, you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Searcy. Thanks for your leadership. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right, next is item 35, text amendment 17006, amending title three, design standards for zoning regulations with various amendments. I will note for the record that this was advertised to have public hearing today, so if anyone is here, they may testify, but the public hearing is going to be continued to June 19th. Thank you, David Carey with the City County Planning Department. Um, would also note that this item is related to item 38 on the agenda as well so we have design standards under resolution form and then the uh, under ordinance form would be the actual code amendments that are proposed as part of this package uh, we have a package of, of changes here before you that uh, mostly are uh, <clears throat> amendments and changes that are uh, identifying areas of the code and the design standards that 
are either outdated or um, have not been used. Uh, and I would say the vast majority of this proposal is of that form. There are a few more substantive changes that are involved here. Uh, we do have George Wesselhoff and Steve Henderson here uh, to talk about any questions you might have on the details of the, the different components of this. Uh, I think there might be a few questions uh, that, that we'll, we as a group will handle. I would note that this uh, package has been out for public review since March. Uh, it did go to the Mayor's Neighborhood Roundtable. Uh, it did get approved unanimously by the Planning Commission as well. Um, again, I would just reiterate that this, this is a package of changes that have been um, kind of on our list of things to do uh, for the past several years, most of them. Uh, and it's a, uh, an effort that we've had. Um, we had a package similar to this last year and then in previous years be, uh, before that to try to make sure that our code and our standards are up to date as much as possible and reflecting current practice as well as uh, addressing the needs of our community. Um, uh, on a more uh, light note, we probably are more or less committed to not coming forward with another major package like this for a little while anyways, because we've done it two years in a row now. So uh, with that, uh, I'll be available for questions and answers and Steve and George as well. Larry? Thanks for being here, David. I had questions about the deletion of chapter 3.6 because this chapter deals with standards for construction, development, and maintenance on parkland. And I guess, could you help us understand the rationale for deleting this section and whether or not the park maintenance standards in particular are dealt with elsewhere? Uh, I just want some reassurance that some of the items they address are actually um, somewhere else in our codes or comp plan, et cetera, that, that, that we aren't just obliterating mowing standards, for example. Right. So uh, we did follow up with um, Parks Department staff uh, in particular on this question, and uh, they, they reiterated to us that, that these standards are not what they use for their maintenance and ongoing work efforts in the park. So uh, it is... Uh, a, a section of the design standards that are not being used, and that's why they're proposed to be to be removed from the design standards. The the, the follow-up question, of course, is okay. Well, what what are your standards, and what do you do, and how do you make sure that that happens? And uh, what was explained to us as part of this process, and then today, in fact, was that uh, they use um, general policies and in a general sense um, as far as their mowing, but it's also very much a site by site, park by park um, consideration based on their district. So um, that is something that the Parks Department, that's how the Parks Department has been handling that. Um, we certainly, uh, one, one idea that I do have, if there's an ongoing question about that, and I don't believe we have Lynn here or JJ, because uh, they weren't prepared to be at this hearing today. Uh, since we do have to carry this hearing over, we certainly could have them here next week before we would take action on this. I, I'd appreciate that because I want this to, I want our you know, code to reflect reality, but I also don't want it to allow for a lesser reality. Sure. And if, in fact, there are other standards they're adhering to, I'd like to be clear on what they are and where they are. Sure. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Carey. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right, next are public hearing ordinances, second reading and related resolutions. Item 36, approving a star train transportation agreement between the city and UNL for the Route 24 Holdridge and Route 25 Vine intercampus bus service route for a five-year term. Mr. Chair, Council, my name is Mike Davis. I'm the transit manager for the city and I'm here in regards to the agreement between the city and UNL for routes 24 and 25. And a little bit of history, StarTran has been providing bus service for UNL since 1994. And we have two separate agreements. One is in regards to innovation campus service and one is in regards to 24 and 25. And it's the 24 and 25 agreement that uh, is before you today. And our ridership on these routes is approximately 4,000 one-way trips per day. And the uh, costs laid out in this uh, agreement, uh, the operating costs include a 3% per year annual increase um, and are based on our actual costs. And then our capital costs, we've done something a little bit different with. We, instead of UNL uh, owning buses and if, if the agreement is terminated, having to pay them back, we have gone to more of a service 
type of agreement where they pay uh, an amount to cover the capital costs each year. And so that uh, new uh, way of doing that is reflected in this agreement. The services, though, have not changed in this agreement from the previous agreement. And this uh, contract was approved by the UNL Board of Regents on March 31st, 2017. And I'm here to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Davis? Cindy. Thanks for being here today, Mike. Um, okay, so I had a question about this capitalization. I understand that there's, right now there's five buses that are paid for that are out of the nine and four that the um, capitalized cost is being reflected in our expenses, correct? That's correct. Okay. And um, knowing that, of course, buses have a life span that's somewhat limited, is that kind of our plan going forward? Or are we, are we have funds that we're putting away when it's time to replace those buses? Or kind of what's our plan from here? So we have... Um UNL, when they first signed up for service, they paid 100% of buses up front. Um, and, and so that is the, the, there's nine buses in this agreement, the four that, that were paid for 100%, um, excuse me, the five that were paid for 100%, and then the four buses we've moved into this new category. And so we, we've done what we've called an annualized cost for that. So we've taken the, the cost of the bus and then, um, which is approximately five hundred thousand uh, dollars per bus, so times that times four. There's some miscellaneous equipment that goes on those buses as well, so that was included in that cost. Um, and then um, we uh, take the lifespan of a bus, which is typically um, uh, a bus can be replaced at 12 years and typically is replaced uh, no later than 15, 16 years. And so that information is included into that to come up with that uh, annualized cost of service. And so, yes, we wouldn't apply that formula to the other five buses until uh, that uh, time frame runs out when those buses were purchased, so, uh, which is 2027. Okay. That was my next question. Thank you very much. Other questions? John. Thank you, Mr. Davis, for your presentation. Just going to follow up on my colleague there, if we've got a five-year contract and there's roughly 200 and some thousand a year to amortize the cost, let's say that for some reason the university does not renew this, then we still have an unamortized am amortized amount because I think you said it goes through 2027, so over a 10-year basis <coughs> on the buses. What's that do to the financial implications to the city and so forth? Yeah, we're confident if things are terminated that we can uh, make that work if we have to pay back that percentage. But that's the exact reason why we want to go to this new format so we're not obligating ourselves into the future. Um, so um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Well, you said that be sure we're, we are paid back or we have to pay the, I think you said we pay back. But so they, the university would need to pay us the unamortized cost, would it not? Right. Well. Or does the agreement reflect that? Yeah, so um, on the five buses, the, if, for, for, if the contract is terminated by either party, then the amount uh, left on those buses gets paid back to UNL. Uh, so it's the city paying UNL on the five buses. The four buses, there's no, um, that's just an annualized cost and there's no payment back to UNL. And we anticipate future contracts being just this annualized cost as well. You know, I'm assuming a worst case scenario. Well, if we had to say five years, we had to pay back for those first five buses. What are we going to do with an extra five buses? We um, we have a fleet of 67 total total buses, so we would um, <coughs> integrate that into our fleet um, and capital replacement plan. So uh, we always have that need for buses. So it yeah, we wouldn't have a, a problem there. So you wouldn't go purchase some, you'd probably curtail or the purchase program? Well, so, um, so they would just remain in the fleet and we would maybe delay replacement of, of well, um, as, um, as buses uh, retired, we would not replace those and use these if the contract was terminated. I think is the best way to explain that. Um, 
So you have 67 buses, 13 are dedicated to UNL. If those 13 buses, um, nine for this particular contract uh, were eliminated, then we would only have a need instead of the, the 13, uh, 50, 54 buses. And, um, and so we would shrink our fleet, but we would do that when buses, we replace about 10 buses every three years. So it would just be integrated into that replacement plan. I guess the way you've described it, and as, as I understand it, again, this is a worst case scenario if we became disenchanted with one another, that the city is really taking the risk on that and suddenly faced with nine to 13 buses that it otherwise would not have. And plus it had to pay back the university for some of the upfront costs. And it seems like that could be an expensive proposition that I'm not sure that, at least on the surface, that that sounds equitable. And Again, that's the, exactly the reason on the four buses we're moving away from, from that. There was language in the past contract to that effect, and now we're moving to just this annualized cost where there's a, both an operating and a capital piece each year that, that we pay toward. But we have to let the previous buses that have already been purchased uh, play out. Um, and, and again, I don't think, I don't foresee any loss to the city. Uh, because we have a need to replace approximately 10 buses every three years, um, if all of a sudden we have these extra 13 buses, uh, we we can we can, as we dispose of buses, they'll we'll be able to reduce our fleet down without having any any problem or effect. If anything, the opposite's happening. We're um, uh, um, in in a mode where we're probably growing our fleet more than shrinking it at the at the moment. It just seems like for five years with that amortized, we're only amortizing two hundred thousand, which is two buses essentially out of the four that we're providing. So I just want to make sure that we're protected and there's a, a equitable agreement between the university and us because we're good partners. Thank you, Carl. Thanks, and I appreciate John asking those questions. Uh, Ridership, Mike, of the you said 4,000 trips daily on on these two routes. How does that compare with any of our other routes in the city? Good question. So the UNL ridership overall, which is on an annual basis, it's 650,000 for these two routes. Our overall ridership is around 2.3 million. So UNL ridership is about a quarter of our overall ridership. Um, and we have about 18 overall routes, and these are there's four routes that serve UNL. So they're they're definitely um, higher used than than our other routes. They we pile a lot of students to take them between city campus and east campus, and and they're the they're really uh, they do a great service. But yeah, they're they're some of our higher capacity routes compared to the others other routes in the system. Thank you. Larian. Thanks, Mike. Could you just go over one more time how this five-year contract is different from the previous contracts in a way that you believe is advantageous to the city? Because I'm not sure I, I totally am clear on that. And I want okay. To be. Thank you. Uh, yes, be happy to. So uh, there are nine buses in the agreement overall, and uh, five of these buses uh, were paid for 100% in full, and they have a they have a 12 year lifespan, and they were purchased back, I believe, um, in 2015. So in 2027, their useful life will be up basically for those buses, and uh, for the other four buses, we they haven't been purchased up front in full. And so we have gone to an annualized cost, which includes in that formula uh, approximately $500,000 per bus for each of the four buses, and also the cost of uh, new AVL, automatic vehicle location equipment. And then um, we do take into consideration that we receive some federal funding. Um, and so that is taken into consideration in the amount of 17%. Uh, which leaves um, a, a total cost for 
a total cost per bus of 435,755, uh, and then that cost, uh, that 435,000 per year, let's see, that 435,000 per bus cost is annualized to 49,000 um, per year, so 49,000 for each year for over 12 years times the number of buses, which is four, to come up with that amount of 200,000. And then additionally, the other, the five buses, we do have to go back and put AVL equipment on those, and so there's an additional, uh, uh, the, the cost of that is an additional $10,000 per bus, and so that's added to that for a total of 207,000. So I know it's a little bit, uh, complicated in understanding how we're moving away from buying the buses up front and potentially having to pay back if the contract is terminated to this annual annualized cost. And the formula for that annualization, I think, is a, it's a payment of 5% uh, per year over 12 years uh, to come up with that. So we've added in that the buses are going to go up and uh, buses are going to cost more into the future is, is taken into consideration in that annualized cost. So the advantage now is that instead of having to buy them up front, you can annualize the cost. And does that speak to John's concern about whether or not you end up having to purchase all of them if for some reason UNL was to decide to withdraw its part of the contract? Is that, does that help us not purchase, yeah. let's say, all four in the annualized way? Or are you going to go ahead and purchase them and have annualized payments? But somehow right so we have the um, we have the nine buses today this is a continuing contract and uh, it doesn't get so the one thing it does now is if all of a sudden the contract was terminated in two years we'd have to look at how many years are left on the bus potentially maybe seven years we would have to take seven um, seven twelfths of that bus and provide that money back to UNL under, under the way the contract um, has been written in the past. And we would still have to do that for the five buses until they retire in 2020, 2027. Um, under this new contract, it's just a part of service. There's, an annual, there's a capital cost and an annual cost. And if we were to uh, buy 67 buses for StarTran, uh, we've looked at that to see what that annualized cost would be and a percent uh, that we potentially would get from federal funding. And we're trying to make sure that the costs that we have get attributed directly to UNL. And again, that probably the best thing on to understand the vehicles is to show you our vehicle replacement schedule. Um, Can we bring that up? Thank you. And so basically in 2018, we have um, we have 13 vehicles that are going to be replaced. That's orange and green right here. So for instance, if the contract under my example, was terminated in two years, we would, uh, rather than replace these vehicles, they would just be retired. And then we would use the UNL vehicles into our regular service. So hopefully that, um, and again, every three years we purchase buses. So if, if it was terminated in four years, we would again uh, take that next group of buses that we purchase and uh, not replace those, but would use those buses in regular service. If I, Mr. Chair, if I could follow. It seems like we're in previous contract, the university was putting up front the cost to purchase them, but that totally eliminated the city from this equation unless there was a termination contract, whereas now we're having to put the money up front with the university paying us back over five or 12 years, assuming the contracts go. So it seems like it's a reverse thing, putting more risk on the city in that regard. Actually, I think it's putting less because he said that going forward, as you each, the cost of replacement buses is considered into this formula. 
correct? Right. So, so we've right we've taken that consideration. Um, um, that annualized cost is increased in such a way that it covers that in the future. So yes, we will definitely have the money to purchase buses in the future in the same way that we have in the past. But if the contract's terminated, you, you don't get any more money from the university. And in fact, if the contract's terminated, we have to pay the university for the unamortized portion of the 12 years that the contract didn't complete. Um, Did you write correctly? I think bus. that's partially correct. Um, the Only on the five buses. So we'd have to pay them back. And we on, the five on the five buses. buses. The four buses that are amortized, we don't have to pay back. Uh, and that's the But we still have to pay for them because we've paid for them up front, so there's nothing to pay the university back. We've fronted the money. But we have the buses. Right, right. <laughs> well, we'd have the buses the other way because we're buying them then from the university. Either way, we have buses. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Connolly is going to tell us <laughs> the truth. <laughs> now, remember, attorneys are not accountants. But uh, that's, exactly, that's exactly right. Chris Connolly, assistant city attorney. Um, I, I have been working with Mike on this. Uh, first of all, we have to recognize that if UNL decides to walk away from this contract they don't have a service all right so that's that's a big concern for them obviously but secondly uh the whole idea here is is to to make this shift because we can better account for all the costs uh, by doing it as an annualized cost of service rather than just having them buy buses up front yes there were some advantages to having them front the the money up uh, at the very beginning of the contract but uh, as mike was able to analyze this he, he determined really that it made more sense to spread these costs out over time, and we get a fixed payment from, from UNL that covers everything. And therefore, uh, there's less risk of, of things inflating more than they should because we've got an inflation factor built in instead of having the money just fronted for the, bu the buses up front. So this is really a, a more comprehensive way of covering the total cost of the service. And we would do this for, <clears throat> for anyone that wanted to be uh, to, to uh, if, if another college, for example, wanted us to, to provide a service, we're providing a service. We're going to provide all the equipment. We'll provide the drivers. We'll provide everything, and we have one cost for doing that. <clears throat> what we were doing previously with UNL is said, you'll buy the buses, and then we'll provide the service, and it created for a little more complicated scenario. And, and Mr. Camp, you're right that we may end up having to pay some of that back, but we're, we're working our way past that, I guess, is the best way to say it. So, so what I just heard, the most important thing I heard there is, you're borrowing trouble, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I appreciate, and again, these are worst case scenarios, and that's what we lawyers do. But, and you're right too, Mr. Connolly, that the university is going to have to have transportation needs. But sometimes institutions say, we'll, we'll pull this in internally here, and maybe they buy the buses then. But it seems like, I, I just want it to be an equitable agreement between both parties. Both are very ups, outstanding and organizations. And, it would seem like to encourage the continuation of it, maybe there's a discounted amount that one would pay the other if, or the party that discontinued it, but well, I don't well, want to renegotiate the contract. And, and what the contract actually says, it, it, there's not a fixed dollar amount based on the number of years left. What it says is that both parties will negotiate in good faith in the event that there's a termination. Because as we, as we figured out as we were negotiating this, there are so many factors in there, so many variables, it was virtually impossible to say, if you terminate on X date, this is what you owe. We, we really couldn't come up with a fixed number for that. There were just too many other things in play. So both parties agreed that the best we're going to be able to do is try and negotiate this in good faith in the event of a termination. Thank you. Are there any other questions on this item? I think we've hit it hard. <laughs> Thanks for being here. We killed the dead bus. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. Next is item 37, ordinance to readopt ordinance 20304, adopted on March 14, 2016, relating to text amendment 16001, amending chapter 27.59 of Lincoln Municipal Code, relating to airport zoning regulations to extend the approach zone from three miles to a new limit of 10 miles, establish the area included within the airport hazard area, Revive, revise existing definitions and add new definitions and other changes to be in accordance with the passage of Nebraska Legislative Bill LB 140 and repealing various sections. Rick Pavel, State Law Department. This is primarily a housekeeping matter, and this ordinance was adopted without going through a 10-day 10 10 uh, notice of publication prior to adoption in the uh, Journal Star. 
And so in order to ensure that the upcoming airport zoning regulations that's on your agenda for adoption next week are, are valid, we need to readopt this ordinance to make sure it met the, the jurisdiction requirements. Uh, this difficulty kind of arises by the fact that although we're allowed to put airport zoning regulations in our zoning code, it doesn't fall within our general zoning jurisdiction. Airport zoning regulations are a statewide concern that are regulated separately. And so the state, uh, for some reason, had a 10-day rule. We have an eight-day rule. Um, state law, we only have a five-day rule for zoning. So there's just a lot of little uh, gotcha uh, mechanism out here. And we didn't catch the 10-day rule last year. We caught it this year when we were doing this one that's upcoming. Just wanted to make sure we're on solid ground, so we're asking to readopt this ordinance. All right, any questions for Mr. Pale? Cindy. Thank you. Does this in any way impact the uh, drone ordinance that we passed April of last year? Um, I couldn't speak to that one specifically. I know drones are covered separately, so it doesn't fall within this particular ordinances themselves. So I'd have to go back and, and see what was done last year on that one. I not. Okay. Other questions? Thank you, sir. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right, next is item 38, text amendment 17006, amending the Lincoln Municipal Code relating to the land subdivision or ordinance, Title 26, and the zoning ordinance, Title 27. And again, I would note for the record that this public hearing has been continued to June 19th. David Carey with the City County Planning Department. This is, as I spoke earlier in my testimony on the previous item, Previous item that was that we brought forward for uh, public hearing was the design standard piece under resolution. This is the um, the subdivision ordinance and the zoning code uh, under ordinance change. Um, same package of materials, uh, but that is why they're on the agenda two different times. Hey, questions? Yes, if I may, Mr. Carey. Since this the resolution 148 was related to this, should we take them up together next week? I, I think that would be fine if you, yeah, because of Meyer, that would be we, right. Uh, clerk. Okay. okay. Other questions? I'll, I'll change that on the agenda next week that they're listed together. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. All right. Next is item 39, change of zone 17009, application of Ryan Omel for a change from AG Agricultural to AGR Agricultural Residential at Southwest 27th and Roxbury Lane. Again, this public hearing is being continued to June 19th. Uh, Mike Eckert with Civil Design Group here today on behalf of Ryan O'Mell. Um, this uh, change of zone is from AG to AGR, Ag Residential, on a parcel of land on uh, South 27th Street, south of West Denton Road. As many of you are familiar, there are a lot of acreages out there. This is one of the few parcels that I believe has been shown as AGR since the 1977 comprehensive plan and had an existing house on it. Ryan and his wife bought the land, they're rehabbing the house, and we did a community unit plan for four other lots besides the one hill beyond and some phasing to that at planning and it was approved unanimously. So this change of zone is now in front of you for your approval, so. Question is for Mike. Thank you, sir. Thank you. A staff question. Staff question. David, thank you. I just noticed in the staff report that the applicant's asking for a, a waiver to block length, and it just made me question: what? How do block length requirements even apply to acreages? Uh, could you elaborate on that for us? Yeah. Well, and and I think your your question is lies within your question lies part of the answer, which is when it comes to acreage proposals like this, there is a Obviously, there's longer distances involved here, so that is why we are um, in, in, in agreement with the proposal for that waiver. Um, we would apply the same blo block length standards, basically, but at the same time, we take into consideration how the lots are laid out for these types of more acreage developments. I mean, that's the best way we can I can answer that question. I mean, it, it, we 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 are willing to have flexibility when it comes to these types of proposals. Is the requirement for a or is the attempt to apply the standard somehow for future planning when things are more dense in this area? Or like, I don't, I'm just having trouble understanding what, 
where the block even is. I think the, the, the well, the blocks in the future are set up when we have, we, we put in those um, stub roads right. where the, the future layout, you know, the ghost lots that we tried to make sure that we're planning for, um, that's where those types of the block length standards can be applied in the future. Uh, and what we, what we do at this stage is we just make sure that we have that opportunity in the future. So there's not a house sitting right where the block would So shift. there's not a house right there, but also that we are at least acknowledging that there are going to be future roads there when that density can be provided in the future. Um, so that's... So it's I like build-through design? Or? It, it, there's an attempt there to try to make sure that we're planning for that. So that that's where we're in the future, when and if that happens, we have an opportunity to have a better layout there, and that's where those block lengths can actually be, those standards could actually be applied more. And you're comfortable then, obviously, with this particular proposal? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. Next is item 40, change of zone 3134E, application of Lucille Park LLC to amend the Willow Springs planned unit development to adjust the setbacks at the perimeter of the PUD to accommodate an office building with a drive through facility on property generally located at the northwest corner of Lucille Drive and Pioneers Boulevard. I will note for the record that public hearing has been continued to June 19th on this item as well. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Brad Marshall with Olson Associates here on behalf of Lucille Park LLC. Uh, they are bringing forward an application to you for a uh, change of zone for the PUD, Will, um, Little Springs PUD, um, to allow a, a bank with a drive through facility. The current zoning allows office which does allow financial institutions, but uh, we are requesting a, a drive-through facility. In addition to that, we are requesting a uh, reduction in setback against green spaces, which are on the north and west sides of the site. Uh, we're keeping and maintaining the standard setbacks along the roadsides. If there are any questions, we have to answer this for you. It's for Mr. Marshall. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. Next is item 41, text amendment 17010, amending title 27 of Lincoln Municipal Code, zoning code, by amending various sections. Someone here to testify on this item? And I'll note for the record, the public hearing has been continued to June 19th on this as well. David Kerr with the City County Planning Department. Here today to talk about um, this text amendment. Um, this is dealing with the, uh, the, a proposed change and actually the best thing for me to do is put this on the overhead. This is part of the staff report, but what we're proposing is a, the, the, chain, the proposal to allow for uh, different types of solar um, projects in our city um, to provide for the opportunity to have both large and small solar projects uh, currently in the code. What we have is just the opportunity for a single uh, called commercial solar energy conversion system. Um, and that is uh, what is being proposed here is a pro specific project out in the Capitol Beach area. Um, a, uh, a, a special permit is coming forward at a future uh, date to you, but there is a need for a code amendment to allow for what is being proposed there uh, at a site specific uh, status. What we're proposing here is to allow for um, two different sizes of projects. One for, basically the, the breaking point would be at the 100 kilowatt level, which is consistent with how LES looks at these. Um, it's also a wind, the, consistent with how much power is produced from some projects for wind energy as well. So that's where the 100 kilowatt uh, differentiation between small and large comes into place. What we're really dealing with here is to allow for, on a, uh, on a site by itself, uh, the actual type of um, conversion system from so for solar. Uh, currently, we allow by right as an accessory use uh, on, on lots. This would be for a singular use on, uh, in, in many cases, will be what will be an outlot, which is the case for the proposed project out in Capitol Beach. What you see on this chart here is what uh, is being proposed. And really what I like to focus on here is the idea that in the AGR and in the, the residential districts, R1 through R8, as well as the O1 through O3 and the RT. So these obviously are either residential districts or those districts that will be near residential areas. We are uh, proposing that that be, have a special permit process to go through so that we are being sure 
the impacts to residential areas or those that are close to residential areas uh, have that extra level of review before an approval is given. We are also allowing through the B1 and B5, the H1, H2 through H4, and the I districts uh, on these smaller scale systems that they would be permitted uh, going forward under this change. And again, a lot of this is to allow for our city to be much more open to, to solar uh, power systems uh, moving forward. I would note that um, under the Soul Smart uh, program, uh, we very recently, the city of Lincoln was identified as a bronze level for that. This go also is another step in the direction of trying to make sure that our city is open to these types of uh, energy systems. Uh, it is something that we feel that is a, a worthy effort to take the step forward. Um, and I think I'll stop there and see if there's any questions on this. John? Yeah, when you talk about these categories, Mr. Carey, and I appreciate you bringing this forward, how, how big a panels are you talking about? Are these solar farms? Or are these just a single panel or two on a rooftop? Or like the Capitol Beach, what is that going to be? Uh, so I'll use that one as an example. What we have is an outlet there that is fairly long, um, and it is, uh, it's owned by the association out there. Uh, I, one other piece to this, in, 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 the, in the case of using an outlet in a residential area, there is a requirement here under the special use process to uh, have the, the ownership within that residential area be owners of the, the lot that's, in gener that's being proposed to be used. So just to clarify that as well. These uh, would be, I'm trying to think of exactly the size of them. Uh, they do range in size, um, but we do have a limitation within this pro proposed process as well to limit them to no higher than 20 feet at their highest angle of the arrays being tilted up as high as they can go of 20 feet. If you put that in perspective, the height limit within a residential district generally uh, for single family uh, in, in those smaller structures is 35 feet. So we do have some, some control in there as far as the overall height. Uh, as far as the specific technology, I believe there's a fairly decent range of what could be put in there. Uh, but we do have that put in there so that there is the understanding that we don't want to get too very much higher than 20 feet because that would be an obstruction for the homes that would be in that area. Well, I'm thinking too as technology keeps improving there may be a mm -hmm. certain square footage of a solar panel yeah. could actually produce twice as much. Yeah, we're certainly not limiting what they can do but we, we, are, we do want to be clear about that height being a, a little bit of a concern. And you said all of these would be a case-by-case -case basis? Under the special permit aspect of it, yes. And I'm, I'm thinking out loud, we've had some concern with, for example, cellular towers in the neighborhoods, and so I assume this might be a kind of a similar situation where people might be concerned about the reflection into their homes or what have you. And uh, Correct. And we did a learning along the way here. We understand now that, not now, but we, we reiterated the information as part of this process that these solar panels really are, are really non-reflective anymore. They're oh. really ab absorbing light. They're not, not that much of a of a hindrance, but those are good points to be made to make sure that we're not l letting that happen. Are we seeing any movement, uh, when you talk about Capitol Beach, which is just south of the airport, uh, are we seeing any movement to having maybe a solar farm of some size there? I know in Indianapolis, for example, all around its airport, they have quite a few areas that uh, would otherwise just sit vacant. We do have the LES farm off of I-80 on the north side of I-80 I to the west of the city. Um, so we do have that, that that came through for approval and and, and, and for construction. The, I'm unaware of any proposals to do anything further than that, but uh, this would allow for some more activity like that to happen. But again, that would fall, what you're considering is more of the large scale, um, and that looks slightly different than the, the small scale version of what we're talking about here, but this does have the large scale change to the language as well. Thank you. Larry? That's what I was gonna get to, uh, to your point about, you know, impact. Um, Part of the reason this is an exciting amendment is that it is potentially increasing access to solar uh, energy throughout our community. And part of the reason it's the access is increasing because you're making this distinction between small systems right. and large systems. Could you speak to that briefly? Yeah, there is. In order to, to get a lot of um, power generated, um, you have to have, with the technology today, you still have to have a fairly large footprint to be able to do that. Um, hopefully the technology will improve over time so that we don't need as much of a footprint to collect as much energy. What, what the differentiation is here for the small scale is it's intended to be on a smaller footprint, obviously, uh, to be serving the, the uses that are nearby. Uh, in, in this example, in Capitol Beach is exactly what's being proposed. Um, so the, the larger scale is certainly intended to be 
um, potentially the large scale. So we don't have a project to, to speak to on that, but that is the differentiation that this change provides as well. So we're trying to cover the basis on that. And then with the smaller scale projects, you're creating some provisions like screening Correct. so that it minimizes the impact on neighborhoods, but still is promoting um, renewable energy sources for Lincoln. Correct. And the, the, the screening, the, the typical screening for what could be done to accomplish the screening is a six foot fence. But um, there may be other, there are other ways to do that, but that we're, we're trying to make sure that they're it's able to be accomplished so that we're not a hindrance to the project like that. Can you give us an example of what would actually be screened? You know, I think what John was describing is like it's on the roof. I mean, you can't really screen that with a six foot fence necessarily. Well, in the what, case of the Capitol the Beach, the, these are gonna be arrays that are on the ground, that are situated on the ground. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what that level of screening would provide is that you're not seeing the structure that's implanted into the ground effectively. Um, you're probably still gonna see especially at an angle, it's, it's going to be visible still. But the idea is that you're, you're not seeing kind of all the, the, the underneath area that wouldn't necessarily look good to the neighborhood. But again, in the case of Capitol Beach and in many of these, what we expect is that it'll be property owners that are in those areas that are coming forward with the project too. So they're accepting that there's going to be something there as well. We certainly heard from people in the community who've wanted it to be easier to do solar power for their homes. Is this in response to that? How did, what, what started this? Is this a responsive change? Uh, well, it's a responsive change in the sense that this is a proposed project coming from property owners out in Capitol Beach. Right. So there is that part of it. I think that what you see here being proposed is a, a solution or a better way of handling these types of things and differentiating the size of them so that you can have different types of projects either permitted or allowed by special permit. And again, just to be clear, the, this doesn't affect um, the ability of, say, a property owner to put solar panels on their roof. Those are considered, that's considered an accessory use that's already allowed and would continue to be allowed. So. Okay, other questions for Mr. Carey? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Mr. Chair. I have a question for our clerk, uh, Ms. Meyer. On a couple of these, you said the public hearing was continued to June 19th. Does that include voting that date or just the mm -hmm. public hearing? Like that the, includes voting. Yes, it would have action as well that day. Okay. Maybe just for future reference, we consider saying public hearing and action or just so we're Certainly. all clear. Yep. Good afternoon. My name is Terry Whitler. I live at 1940 Surfside Drive in the Capitol Beach area. I'm here in support of this uh, text amendment to the zoning code. Uh, along with uh, two other neighbors, we've formed a limited liability company and our, uh, we've approached our neighborhood association. We've uh, uh, obtained permission to use an area that's uh, a common area on our association, but that is unused and really unusable because of its elevation and uh, the fact that it's relatively difficult to access. Uh, our goal is to recruit 20 homeowners in our area to participate in this project. We arrived at that number because uh, the LES program that we want to participate in uh, caps an individual project at about, well, at 100 kilowatts of generating capacity. Uh, roughly speaking, a typical homeowner might uh, use five kilowatts of capacity a year, so that's why we chose 20 to participate. Um, we worked with the city planning department and they indicated to us that they felt like a text amendment change was needed, so that's why we are supporting this, this project. Uh, our interest here is, um, as was previously mentioned, any homeowner can put these panels on their uh, rooftop and LES has a very good program for people that wanna do that. Uh, not everybody wants those on their roof. There are some concerns about leakage and other issues and also the orientation of your roof. So some of us would prefer to have this freestanding option. That's why we've come forward with this project. Um, I can tell you that the panels will be roughly the size of one of these doors over here. Uh, there will be several hundred of them. Uh, they will cover an area that's maybe half a football field depending on how we uh, have to lay them out. Uh, they will be screened, uh, they will be located in an area that is roughly six foot below the surrounding grade of the street and the homeowners. 
uh, which is one reason why it can't be used for anything else. Uh, they will be behind a uh, wall of trees, many of which are evergreen, so that year-round they'll provide screening. Uh, we chose this location because uh, LES already has a line going through this area. They have the necessary transformers uh, in that area for us to uh, uh, attach to. Um, so that's, that's why we're in support of this program. I did want to mention that uh, at the uh, uh, request for a special permit before the Planning Commission, a question came up that I was not prepared to answer at that time dealing with the property tax implications. I've since gone back and uh, checked the Nebraska law. And in 2010, the legislature adopted a provision that said that uh, uh, renewable energy sources placed on property cannot be factored into the assessed value of the real estate. Instead, they, there is a capacity tax in lieu of a property tax, uh, depending on the size of your, your project that will be assessed. But it will not affect the underlying property values uh, of the land owned by the association. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Mr. Whitler? Carl. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Whitler, for coming forward and for your interest in, in this project. So we'll be hearing something, a specific proposal on this project that you have. Is that right? Or I hope not. Okay. So this, this, is, <laughs> this is it. Okay. Uh, no, I, should, I don't mean to be facetious. We are, we are working through the special use pr pr uh, process. Okay. Um, we determined that we needed to change the setback requirements slightly to use land as near to the interstate as possible. So we have to go back to them on June 21st, if that's a Wednesday. My understanding is that if they approve that special use permit, and if no one objects within 14 days, that uh, will not come before the council again. So that's the reason for my answer. Okay, very good. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, sir. Would anyone else like to testify on this item? Next item, please. That concludes our public hearing. We can move into the voting session. Public hearing resolutions, item 32, the report of new and pending claims against the city and approving disposition of claims set forth for the period of May 16 through 31st, 2017, introduced by Gaylor Baird. So moved. Second. Moved by Larry and seconded by John. Excuse me, Carl. Uh, comments, uh -huh. questions? I, I guess I would make motion to amend number one that would remove uh, Cynthia Swanson from the denied claims. Second. Amendment number one moved by John, seconded by Jane. And I believe this was because she was unable to attend right. and so would reschedule her appearance. Okay. Okay, John, just so you know, I had already previously oh. assigned that task to Cindy, so I'd ask you to I pay attention. I didn't think that was an assignment. But. <laughs> okay, so uh, move, <laughs> motion to amend, moved by John. Seconded by Jane. Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Now yes. the main motion. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 33 is the interlocal agreement between the city, Lancaster County, and Saunders County for the development of a Local Workforce Investment System, introduced by Gaylor Baird. So moved. Second. second. Moved by Larry and seconded by Benny. Discussion? Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Item 34 is the transfer of appropriations in the amount of $25,000 from miscellaneous budget contingency to general expense to sponsor the Nebraska 150th celebration introduced by Gaylor Baird. So moved. Second. Moved by Larry and seconded by Jane. Discussion? Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Next then are public hearing ordinances second reading where items 36 through 41. 
Third reading, item 42, Street and Alley Vacation 17003, vacating a portion of the South 16th Street right-of-way directly north of Pine Lake Road. Introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Moved by Carl, seconded by Cindy. Discussion? Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Show? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Kaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried, 7-0. Item 43 is Comp Plan Conformance 17007, declaring approximately 60,984 square feet of property, generally located at 7701 Gray Cliff Drive as surplus property. Introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Moved by Carl, seconded by Jane. Discussion. I'd like to make a motion to amend on this item. It's motion to amend number one, and the purpose uh, has two purposes. One is to um, delete an incorrect description of the size of the property, but secondly, to uh, ensure that the sale proceeds of this land that we're surplusing are credited to Lincoln Fire and Rescue. And uh, this came up in our discussion last week. Um, this land was initially intended to be the site of a fire station in Southeast Lincoln. Later, it was determined to not be an ideal location to improve emergency, to maximize emergency response times. So since then, uh, we obviously have, as a city and a community, decided to build out uh, new fire stations and one joint police fire station to improve emergency response times. Looking at this land uh, that has an estimated value of roughly $140,000, uh, by, by tying the, the sale of this property to the larger project and crediting it to LFR, that's you know, that's potentially $140,000 less in sales tax revenue that we would need to collect to meet our public safety obligations. So uh, that is the reason for the amendment and um, appreciate discussion, your support. Discussion on the amendment? Please call the roll. Uh, did we have a second? I, I think Jane seconded that, Okay, yeah. thank you. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Now on the main motion. Raybould? Yes. Shobe? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion carried 7 to 0. Next then, resolutions first reading are items 44 through 52. We have no ordinances first reading. Our pending list date certain is item 53. Anyone wishing to address the council on a matter not on this agenda and not plan to appear on a future agenda may do so at this time since it is an open microphone session. And Mr. Chair, seeing nobody coming forward to testify, I move for adjournment. Second. Moved by John, seconded by Jane. Please call the roll. Raybold? Yes. Show? Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Eskridge? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Lamb? Yes. Motion. 7 to 0. Adjourned.